everybody and welcome to our discussion of the 2020 vintage. Uh, we're delighted to have you here this evening and I'm equally delighted to have our uh, illustrious um, guest, Jasper Morris MW, here with me. Um, not quite with me, we're, I think we're about seven or eight miles apart in Burgundy. He's up in his village in uh, his house in Bouillon, I'm in, in Nuit Saint-Georges, well that's, that's pretty close. Um, Jasper, who at times has been obviously a, a wine merchant, a, a wine author, wine critic, wine judge, um, obviously general Burgundy guru, exceptional, um, and probably now fair to say, um, also a consultant auctioneer, if one is allowed to, to say that. Welcome, welcome Jasper. Uh, hello everybody and uh, hello Jason. And uh, yeah, we're not too far away, but uh, I have a glass of wine in my hand and feeling ready to ready to talk. I've only just got back from um, uh, a day's tasting in the vineyard, so uh, I will try and put out of my mind the reds of Marcinet for a minute and uh, talk about vintage in general. Absolutely. I, I briefly mentioned there about being a, a consultant auctioneer. It would be remiss of me not just to ask to ask you how the Vendée van at the Hospice de Bonewin this weekend. It sounds quite a lively affair. Yeah, it, it, it was crazy and not really our expectations um, because at the moment 2021 doesn't have the cachet of a really top vintage uh, and indeed won't get the cachet of a really top vintage so the wines are nice. Um, so we knew that because the volumes were so low that prices would maintain from the high prices of last year and we expected maybe a small uptick but in the end the whites sold to double 2020 and the reds were up sort of 60% plus. Uh, and there was a magnificent sort of coup de théâtre, you could say, when they sold the president's barrel with this um, really, really good actor called Pio, can't pronounce his second name, uh, who just got the whole room absolutely enthused and it went for an easy, easy record. We have messages coming up on the chat. I hope there'll be more. And excellent. Someone, someone got the, oh, good. Excellent. They didn't know. I didn't see you afterwards. I saw you before. But I mean, you managed to get some good wines. Great. Very pleased. Um, and two of seventy Yeah. So anyway, do um, <clears throat> do keep that chat going to everyone, and then uh, it's, it's, it makes everything more inclusive. I find on these zooms, if you do that. And welcome to uh, yeah, I'll have a quick click through the people uh, who tuned in, and welcome to my my many friends who are who are who are there tonight. Before we before we get going on on the very positive news of 2020, um, it, it would be sensible just to say a little bit about 2021 in terms of the lack of wine. Um, what what are the worst figures that you've heard in in discussions with growers? Oh, um, um, I mean, some people I suppose are down in just about in double figures, sort of 12 or 15 hectolitres a hectare. So. Uh, yeah, that's really tiny. I mean, nobody is making full crops anymore because of various things that are happening in the vineyards. Um, so no one is talking about hitting the yields which are theoretically allowed. But even so, a good producer is hoping to make 30, 35 hectolitres a hectare in red and maybe 45 to 50 in white. Um, and, you know, they're very far away from that. Uh, yeah, I think the worst I heard was Santo Bank producer who would normally have made 40 barrels and has made four. Um, yes, not so good. Yeah. Oh, well, still, I mean, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of individual hardship and then we just have to wait and see what it means for the, for the trade as a whole. Um, I mean, most of us as individuals seem, are perfectly happy to skip a vintage, but um, I mean, you've got to keep the uh, the trade filled up, restaurateurs still, even if they're not going to drink 2021s yet, um, apart from in bone restaurants where you can't get anything much uh, older than 2019 already. Um, but uh, it, it does mean there is going, there's going to be further pressure. Let's, let's, let's talk about something more positive. Let's talk yeah, about exactly. vintage, which we've, we've both tasted to, to, to quite an extent so far. Um, can you just give a little bit of background on, on the growing season um, in 2020? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's actually very simple. It was very clean and clear. <laughs> uh, it started very early. Um, it's 
about the uh, only year since 2016 when in the end there wasn't really any frost risk at all. Temperatures did get quite low, people were, were prepared, but they didn't have to light the candles or do anything else. So it got through the frost all right, possibly the earliest flowering on record. And that's actually going to be quite important. I'll come to that a little bit later on. Very dry throughout, though fortunately there had been quite a lot of rain during the winter. So I remembered that one of the reasons why the yields were so high, unexpectedly high, in, um, uh, in 2018. Um, and uh, that was because of all the, all the winter. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so, so that helped a bit. But it was a dry season. People, I was hearing comments, um, mostly from people living far away, saying it sounds like 2003 all over again. But it never felt like that at all. Um, because uh, there weren't any great heat spikes. In 2003, it was, uh, got immensely hot in June and again in the middle of August. Um, in 2019, there were a couple of spikes when it got really hot. But 2020 was just a very even temperature and a high temperature, yes, but very even all the way through until perhaps in August, um, early August, it did get a little bit warmer. But there was never that, that hideous sort of approaching 40 degrees um, centigrade. Uh, things stayed in the mid thirties most of the time. So, so that was helpful. Um, and people were expecting to pick maybe around about the 20th, latest 25th, no, 25th of August, let's say. So before the end of August, so used to be an incredible rarity, no longer the case. And when they came back from their holiday, those who took a holiday, they realized most of them, they had to start earlier. So the first people I know of who started picking may have been a a few, a couple of days earlier, around about the 17th, but let's say typically the 20th was the start in the Cote de Bone. And um, that sounds ridiculously early, but then if you think back to the flowering, it's almost 100 days after the flowering, and that traditionally used to be the, the signal that things would be right 100 days after the immediate midpoint of the flowering. So in the end, the grapes did get their necessary hang time on the vines. It's just that everything happened earlier than usual. So that was the background. Um, some people, as always, pick early. Some people pick late. Uh, a case in point was that yesterday I did seven different visits in Von Romane. Four of them had started and finished, pretty much finished, in the month of August. And the other three didn't start till the 7th or 8th of September. So there was really two schools of thought. Um, and some people who waited were waiting in the hope they'd get a bit of rain, but the rain didn't really happen. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that was the picture. Um, Sarah's asked about uh, what were the alcohols, um, and they're incredibly variable um, all over the place. Uh, let's talk about the whites first, shall we, Jason? Is that all right? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think they're, they're terrific. There, there was something I wanted to ask you about the whites. It took me quite a long time to get my head around how they were so fresh. Yeah. We, we just talked about heat. Um, yes. They're quite remarkable. And I, I kept asking individuals why, why are, they, why are they so full of vibrancy and energy? Um, and I wasn't always getting consistent answers. I did wonder, one or two growers talked about the difference between nighttime temperatures and daytime temperatures. Others deny that there was much difference between the two. <laughs> get that break from the heat. So, I mean, you, you live here. Who, who, who is right? Were, were the evening temperatures that much cooler? Well, yeah, uh, yes, they were. They were quite a bit cooler, um, and certainly it wasn't one of those years like two thousand and three when it was unbearably hot um, through nighttime as well. So, so yes, and that, there, there was a reasonable differentiation, which certainly helps. You know, which is why you get. Um, a very good uh, acidity in things like um, uh, you know, Vegas Acidia, the Ribera del Duero wines, because even though it's very hot during the day, they're high up and they get a big diurnal swing, in cooler temperatures at night. So yeah, 2020 was probably quite good in that direction. Um, the other factor, I think, is because of the drought, there was frequently a bit of a hydric stress, which slightly blocked the development of um, uh, the vines almost shut down a bit. And throughout the year, we really only had two winds. We had a north wind, which is cold and dry, and a south wind, which is hot and dry. And uh, as a result of that, 
there was a certain amount of concentration through, uh, through the wind, uh, which concentrated uh, the sugar, which concentrated the acidity as well, and, uh, and also the flavors, what we call the dry extract. Um, so it is a surprise a little bit, and in particular, what's a surprise is that there are no sign in the whites of very ripe flavor profile, which is why I like them a lot. So the profile of the whites is closer to 2017, or perhaps if you picked very early, if you're a sort of a Jean-Marc Rouleau type person, maybe 2014 comes into the picture as well. It's a blend of those two, but rather more of 17, which we think of as the two best white wine vintages, I would say, of the, of the previous 10. Um, so, so it's all good, but I agree with you, Jason, that we didn't really expect that when we started tasting, and I don't think the producers expected it either. Um, and there was lots of juice in the grapes in the white, which there weren't and wasn't at all in the red. So white yields tend to be very reasonable, um, not huge, but a lot of producers in sort of Pivini, Chassin and so on, we're talking about 50, occasionally 55 hectolitres a hectare, which is really the ideal of where they want to be for the village wines, a little bit less where they got in the Premier Cruz. Um, but it turned out to be even though the growing season might not have suggested it, it's turned out to be a really textbook vintage in the whites. The and pH yeah. seemed very good. I beg your pardon? The, the pH seemed seem very good overall in white wines. I missed the first one. The what seems very good? The P pHs. The pHs, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Impeccable. Um, and of course, it's a year in which there was hardly any malic acidity, so that when the malolactic happened, it didn't really drop the acidity. Um, it's really everything you could want. We might just bring in Chablis' conversation because the summer before, uh, uh, when I, uh, right, yes, the summer of 2020, when I was tasting 2019s, you know, I was there in July, uh, it did get quite hot in Chablis, probably hotter than the Cote d'Or. And there was a real feeling that everything might dry out and the grapes get scorched. And they were not optimistic at that point. But Chablis is the one region where in mid-August they did get some rain, which got them back on the, on the straight and narrow. Uh, and I found the 2020 Chablis um, better than I expected and better than 19s, which got a good press. Um, so, um, yeah, that's worked out all right. Um, one or two in the arid site, so up on the plateaus, it did dry out a little bit too much. You get that um, parazine flavour that's sort of like um, green uh, grilled hazelnuts almost. So there were just a few of the minor wines which had that, uh, but that's a rarity. That's not, not typical. And in the Cote d'Or, it's just amazing. Um, I think every single producer I've been to of whites has made good white wines. It's unbelievably consistent. Do you, do you, do you feel that the level of dry extract slightly lower than 17 or very very close indeed um i don't have a firm opinion on that but i would put them in the same broad broad camp um some of the producers have said that they think they prefer their 17s i must admit but not all of them i have in front of me an osidures les Ote from a domain la fouge jean and gilles la fouge which is actually not a domain that i visited so thank you jason for sending those um Samples over. But Les Ote is a, is a favorite vineyard of mine within Oxidures. Um, it's, it's a classic white wine vineyard, more or less north facing, continuation of Merceau, but, but fresher, uh, and is, is a really good place to be. So I haven't tasted it yet, but it's smelling just as good as the others. Um, all of the the all alcohol the levels in white are never very high. Um, yeah. I mean, I haven't tasted much that's hit 14 in white. Um, and I haven't tasted much, which has got flavours of sur maturity. So most of the whites are 13, 13 and a half. Um, and Stephen's asked about Aligote, but frankly, yes, Aligote is fed really well. I've been up in Marcinet today, um, which means I have had a huge range of single vineyard Aligotes from the likes of Sylvain Patay and, uh, and uh, Laurent Fournier, and a few other people are doing that as well. Um, I haven't got to yet. Um, and the joy of Aligote is it really represents terroirs just as well as Chardonnay does and so it's at 12 and a half this year and and the wine's looking gorgeous. Is, do you feel somewhere like OC Duress is really well positioned if we continue to get these 
slightly warmer, warmer vintages. Yeah, I mean, all bets are off if, if the warming continues, uh, the warming continues exponentially. But uh, um, uh, but where it is now, then Ossia de Rest, Sarama, um, as well, um, are, are in a great place and, and up in the Oak Coat too. Yeah. And in terms of longevity, where, where I mean, it's always a horrible question to have to answer so early in, in a wine's life. But all things being equal, these 2020 whites look like they could go the distance. Oh, I think, yes, yes, I do think so. But I don't think they're going to be um, wines which are going to be difficult to taste in their youth, uh, to enjoy in their youth. But uh, I think they, I think these will be um, good long-term aging whites. I mean, everything seems to be in balance for that. So, so no problem at all. I mean, years like 2009 and 2015, I think to get the best of them, you have to age them for quite a long time. 2014 is, if anything, getting younger and younger as it gets older. <laughs> so, so I'm not, not touching any 2014s now. Um, 2017s are reasonably uh, open and, uh, and enjoyable, but not showing any signs of undue aging. Um, I think 2020 will, will follow on the line of 2017. So drinkable early, but with, with very good potential. Well, that's, that's very good news. Um, <coughs> One thing, one thing we didn't mention earlier, and I, we do talk talk about these hundred days from farrowing to harvest. Obviously, with the with the farrowing happening earlier, those hundred days are occurring when there's more sunlight. Yeah. Does that just does that mean a, a more intense ripening period without necessarily the heat causing super maturity? Yeah, well, you know, it's it, it's the end that makes a difference, really. And uh, one aspect of it is that uh, there's a risk that everything's going to ripen on the same day, uh, which uh, can be problematical just from the log logistical point of view. So I have noticed the last few years, lots of the <clears throat> more switched on growers have been ordering up, renting um, big sort of refrigerated lorries in which they can then uh, keep the grapes so whatever time of day they pick the grapes, and some people nowadays are picking mornings only, but whatever time of day the grapes come in, you can cool them down and then process them in your own good time the following day um, or you know, through the evening, whatever. Um, but I think that's, that's quite important. And it, is, it makes such a difference for people who have cottoned on to the fact that they've got to be really smart about um, analysing each parcel, each plot, and going back and trying them again because they can change. You can have two which are at 12 and a half degrees and you think, well, might be ready in two days time. And one of them in two days time is just under 13 and the other is touching 14. So you've just got to go back all the time and keep analysing them and be prepared to vary your order of picking and certainly be prepared to, to start the harvest earlier. Um, yeah. If you had to take the last three vintages, the 18s, 19s and 20s, just talking about whites for the moment, um, is that a fairly easy order for you to put them in quality wise? Easy preference for 20. Um, most people would put 19 second. Uh, I was a little bit less keen on 19 compared to most of my colleagues because I find that is a flavour of sur maturité, of overripeness. It's not overripeness, it's not anything ugly, but just in terms of what I want, I, I prefer the fresher style rather than the richer rounder style. And 2019 doesn't really deliver that, but it's beautiful if you prefer the richer style. And 2018, I think we may have undervalued because the yield was very high and it was a very hot summer. Um, and the wines were sound uh, initially, but I have a feeling that they're actually going to build and get better in bottle. And I think we're already seeing that a little bit. Um, but clear preference for 20. And though there's plenty of good wine in 19 and 18, after that, I would go back to 17 some 15s and all of 14s. Do you, do you think we almost needed 18 and 19 to be able to make such good 20s? Do you think the experience wasn't, wasn't lost on the growers? And... Uh, I don't think that's particularly relevant to the whites. I think it is to the reds. Okay. What is interesting is quite how different in both colours these three vintages are. You could just brush them off and say three hot dry vintages and the wines that come out of them are completely different in both colours. 
Have you, you've got you've got another white there, Jasper. Before we move oh, on, so I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you want to? I mean, we picked we picked a little aperitif there. Yeah, we picked a couple of whites really from slightly slightly cooler sites to show yeah. really what what they've achieved in 2020, and then hopefully this is another one that has. Yeah, and and you pick two people who who are very good, but are not sort of the um, uh, the names that everybody rushes to as soon as an offer comes out. Uh, as I say, La Fouge I haven't been to. Rappé I go to every year, and I think he's one of the unsung heroes. I think he's really smart in both colours. He's Vincent Rappé, um, but he specialises in unfashionable appellations, i.e. all those around Cawthorn plus Bone. Uh, uh, this is, in fact, slightly the riper of the two wines, I would say. It's a premier cru vignard called En Caradeur, which is east-facing, but on the hill that's set a little bit further back. So if you were standing in En Caradeur, you would be looking at the sort of the curve of the hill of Corton in front of you. Um, and uh, the bottom half is, is village, and the, um, sorry, the upper half is village, and the lower half is premier cru, uh, and he's in the premier cru bit. Hmm. It's the same idea though, it's just this lovely fruit which gives no suggestion of excess heat. Um, Gideon, we're talking about Vincent Rappé of Domaine Rappé. Um, and the acidity is there, the acidities are all natural this year, nobody's been messing around and adding, adding things in. Um, uh, whenever I ask producers, you know, what were alcohol levels like, they all said, oh, we didn't need to chapterize this year. And then I would say, actually, I'm asking <laughs> how high they went, not how low they were. Um, but it's not equal everywhere, but in general terms, um, 2020 is uh, low. Most people have 2020s, which are lower in alcohol than 2019s, and it, it does vary. Um, in, in reds, the picture is much more, much more wide spaced. Anything else you'd like to go on whites, or shall we switch to reds? No, I think there's, there's plenty to discuss on reds, so let's, let's move over to those. Okay. Um, because we've had just Margaret's asked about the fashion for strap match <coughs> as pervasive, uh, pervasive in 2020. That's declining anyway, Margaret. Uh, and actually, uh, good smart work by the producers who are the poster boys for it. They've sort of spotted that they were exaggerating it before the market got tired of it, uh, I would say. Um, and Nathan wants to know which villages should one look out for in the whites. Um, I think Chassin's done really well. Uh, especially the lower ground around Morgeau, which we used to think made rather heavy whites. Uh, they, they're doing well in these dry years. Um, Masso's in great shape. The only one of the three really famous names um, that I have slight worries about nowadays is Pudini, because the wines are still very good. You're not getting that very lively floral aspect of the bouquet. They're, they're great in the mouth, but the bouquets are maybe a little bit less exciting. Um, in, in these last few recent hotter vintages. Santa Barra, of course, is, is uh, in great shape until Frosta 2021. But um, Santa Barra, which was normally a little bit higher in acidity and so on and so forth, is, is looking very good in 2020. Um, yeah. Would you view on Pellini with that stretch from village through Premier Crew all the way up to Grand Cru? Uh, it, it, no, it's more village. More, yeah. Yeah. I'd say that's my uh, that comment is uh, aimed more at the villages. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Renato wants to know if the vintage favours oxidative or reductive style producers. I don't get too fussed about that. I'm not sure that the vintages necessarily uh, follows through. Um, I mean, you, yes, you have your house style, which goes one way or the other. Um, but the comment I made earlier on, which has really surprised me, is that every cellar I've been to, I've liked the whites. Um, uh, so it, it, it's working pretty much equally in both. Okay, red time. You know, Noir. Yeah. yeah. So we had a couple of questions earlier on, which I avoided because they're specific about the reds. Um, and uh, so to begin with, um, normally I like to start tasting um, the new vintage about a year afterwards. So I, I try and start tasting the very end of September and into the beginning of October. But this year, nobody wanted to um until well about the, after the 10th of october was the first time i could get any tastings partly the harvest was a bit later in 2021 and partly everybody was completely knackered by all the work they had to do to deliver decent 21s and i have a strong point for burgundy here is 
just how much everybody really kept at it. Nobody dodged the issue. It was a complicated growing season 2021. And they kept, they were still doing their last treatments of the vines into the first week of August. So people were either cancelling holidays or sending the family away and hoping to join them and not being able to. But I just saw these completely wiped out, exhausted producers at the beginning of July. Um, so they hardly got any holiday um, and they, were, they weren't really ready to receive people until they got their equilibrium back. Um, uh, so I started tasting in the Cote de Bone from about the 10th of October. And to begin with, I really hated the reds. Um, Partly because if you're tasting you know, three or four reds after somebody's 15 whites and they're much more white wine people, then it may be they didn't get it right or they chose to privilege in the picking the white wines and the reds have to look after themselves. But in the coat to bone, I think the balance is more difficult uh, and the heat of the year um, has shown more often. It is not universal by any means. There are some utterly great and gorgeous uh, red wines in the Cote de Bone, um, but it was a bit more difficult. And you did see a few 15, 15 and a half, and everybody said, yes, but they stayed fresh. And here's an important point. Let, let's spend a moment, if I may, in discussing about ripeness and picking dates. Because you've got these two schools of thought, one of whom says, it's going over the top, we've got to pick. And in 2020, that was obvious, and two people I'm close to, Ludovine Griveaux at the Hospice de Bone and Dominique Lafont, uh, both of them started picking earlier than they wanted to um, because they felt that some of the leaves were dying. This is, uh, this is again, more true of Cote de Bone than Cote de Bone. And therefore, they wouldn't be pumping, the vines couldn't be pumping any more goodness into the grapes. They were up 13 and a half alcohol already, um, frightened that the acidity might, might die down if they left the grapes unpicked. And they both started picking reds first from around about sort of 17th to 20th of August, and they weren't happy to do so. They knew that the skins weren't completely physiologically ripe, but there's a compromise to be made. And these are smart people. And they said, that's a compromise we're prepared to make. And because the skins aren't completely ripe, we're gonna back off on the extraction so that we don't get anything ugly into the wines. So that was one school of thought. The other school of thought says, uh, but Monsieur, you know, we can't pick until everything is ripe. It's the most important thing, physiological uh, ripeness. And that's what came around with those two schools I was talking about in Verm Romane, one who picked in August and the other who picked one in September. And they said, uh, and it doesn't really matter degrees, and in any case with us, the degrees don't get too high and blah, 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 but you have to have physiological ripeness. And you know, if everything is balanced, then we can accept 14 or 14 and a half percent alcohol. Well, sometimes it, got, it ran away and got more than that. But the other thing that you've got to factor in is what is the flavor profile? Is it still a Pinot uh, flavor profile or is it completely black fruit? Uh, and that's an, an issue which the late pickers, I think, don't take into account sufficiently. Now, I'll, I'll lay on the line at the start that my own palate and temperament probably prefers more often than not the slightly earlier pick, uh, fresh, energetic, still a bit of a mineral feel, if we're allowed to say that. Uh, and based around red fruit rather than black fruit. Because I personally believe that if you have an overripe grape, that's going to stay in the wine forevermore. If you have a slightly underripe grape, that will sort itself out with aging in bottle later on. The wines won't be as attractive in their youth, but they'll get there later. And after all, if you don't accept the slightly underripe grapes um, uh, can um, uh, make good wine in Burgundy, then you wouldn't have had a single good wine between 1959 and 1990, for example, <laughs> which uh, would be a worrying thing and certainly was not the truth. Um, so that's my take. And I do accept that it is one opinion and you can have, a, it's a perfectly valid to say, no, we want to wait for the grapes to be riper. And, um, and you will know which wines that you personally like and uh, you take your decisions uh, from there. So um, I was finding things all over the place um, in in the 2020 Coat of Bone Reds, but with some wines I liked a lot. Some cellars were variable, some worked better, some worked less well. Uh, questions about stems uh, earlier on, I think from Sarah. Um, it's quite interesting. Mostly people are saying, aha, 2020 is so right, uh, stems are right, let's use more. Some people said, despite the rightness, that blockage um, from the hydric uh, stress means that the stems didn't ripen quite as much as the fruit 
did, so we'll be a bit careful. And other people said, um, because the uh, acidity levels are already not too high, um, and uh, our grapes are ripe and the rest of it, there's a risk of um, an imbalance between ripeness of fruit and acidity. And one of the things that does happen when you use lots of stems, even though the wines taste fresher, you actually are removing acidity um, uh, from them. Um, and they were worried about the risk of brethnomyces um, if they use stems. Because uh, it's also true that you're, um, if you have stems in the vat at the top, you do have a little bit more of a risk of bacterial spoilage if you're not really, really careful what you're doing. So there are a few who backed off for that reason. Otherwise, most people who do stems went full steam ahead and some people who only use a little used rather more. So the tendency for 2020 was on the whole, but not invariably, more stems. Certainly not in 2021. Um, now, when I taste these reds, I find that the wines are incredibly intense anyway. Um, maybe I'll just park the stems and I'll reintroduce that later on or remind me if I don't. So first tasting the reds, you're stunned by how deep the colors are. Um, everything's intense. And those colors came out on virtually day one of the um, time in the vat. Um, unbelievably easy to extract things. So almost everybody backed off on the extraction, use this wretched word, I just did an infusion. Um, a few people who always uh, do the punching down continue to do it, and I don't find those vines over tough and over tannic, uh, but the people who continue with uh, punching down, I think do it in a much gentler fashion than used to be the case. Um, so people went for relatively, um, or even very light forms of extraction, and you can't begin to see that in the wines, uh, because naturally the year just gave everything right from the start. Um, now tasting the wines in barrel, sometimes they come over as these massive blockbusters and you can't quite see where the detail is. They appear to be very good wines, but you're not quite sure. And sometimes they come over with much greater grace and elegance and detail. The first thing that makes a difference, and it's a question I ask in every cellar I taste in, is what stage are you at? And the people who have left the wines in barrel <clears throat> and haven't racked at all, which is the tendency these days for people not to rack until they take them out of barrel, I'm not convinced by that, but that is now the standard here. Um, those wines were the more opaque um, to, to try to read uh, wines. And the people who had racked, and this became really obvious in cellars where some wines are racked and some are not racked, the wines which are racked have just had so much more expression. And after a while, I began to realize uh, that this is potentially a great vintage, um, really great vintage for the successful wines. Um, but it won't, be, it won't be all the wines. Um, it, well, it certainly won't be all the producers and it won't be all the wines in any one cellar. So it is, it, it, it's not just gonna be a pile in and, and buy everything, but where the wines have been got exactly right, then it's as great as anything I know. Um, really, really fabulous. And I think coming back to the stems, typically, it's not just a question of the length of the wine after you've finished it and sort of spat it out, and then you get that aftertaste, but just the whole of the wine on the palate, all the time it's in your mouth, it just seems to stretch it out and pull it out and make it longer. And I just found so much more definition in the wines where uh, a proportion at least of stems have been used. But again, please accept when I say this, that I am, relatively speaking, a pro-stem person. Right, that's the end of that little... Uh... One, one question there, Jasper. On, uh, in terms of the, the gentler vinification that growers are allowed to adopt due to the wines being so, so giving in their colour and their structure, um, has that, has that helped ex accentuate to our definition in what is, you know, sometimes in the heat of a vintage, you can lose that sense of what makes each vineyard so special. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, not, not that. Okay, so only the wines I was talking about um, uh, to begin with, which hadn't yet been racked, you couldn't necessarily see it all, but everything which, which was sort of readable, um, the terroir definition is superb. Um, it's not at all uh, better than in 19, for example, um, where I think that the, uh, the heat of the vintage shows in the flavor profile, 
In 2020, the heat of the vintage shows in the massive concentrated wines, but not really in the flavor profile. Now, you kindly sent me a Lafouge and a Rappé Red as well. So we got an Ose Duress, Premier Cru, uh, Climat Duval, which will please my friend Rafi, who's listening in and has already made a plug for the Reds from Lafouge. Uh, and then I've got the Ile de Vergeles, Dave Vergeles, Premier Cru from Rappé. So, I wasn't sure if he was going to send you Eel or Lay, so that's very generous of him. It's Eel, I've got. Yeah. Yeah. The good one. Not that the other isn't very nice. Food, but <laughs> let's just say the special one. <coughs> uh, a wine which I prefer for many a Corton. Um, so, I mean, um, it's uh, one thing I would also say is it's for most people, um, it's a vintage which is going to need a really long elevage. So many people haven't racked yet when they normally would have done um, and will bottle much later. Um, two exceptions on that. One was, um, though the former might change as well. Dominique Lafont felt that. Um, he felt that maybe some of his 2005s, he possibly extracted a little bit too much and that uh, there's a risk um, in the hot dry vintage that they might dry out too much in barrel. Um, and uh, so he doesn't want to do that in 2020. So at the moment, he's thinking about a slightly shorter elevage, but he hasn't acted on it. And the other is de Mendel Romani Conti, who have already taken the wine out of barrel and are preparing all their great Grand Cru's for bottling. Their reasoning is interesting. It's very old fashioned, um, but not, necessarily wrong for that, um, is that the, um, the, the old idea for the élevage is something that you only counted from uh, the moment the malolactic had finished, and then you counted maximum of 12 months for the élevage after malolactic. And at DLC and some other domains, the malolactics were very, very early in, um, in 2020, uh, i.e. around about Christmas time. Um, and so he, uh, Obed de Villain is therefore sort of decided to have all their wines pulled out of barrel and prepared for bottling. Most other people are extending them further and further. Somebody, Julia, asked about the uh, oak aging regime. And um, the tendency at the moment anyway is to use less new oak. But you get wines like this when they express themselves so much, they just don't need any um, uh, additional oak. Um, so most people will either be the same as usual or a few people will be a bit less than usual. Having said which, given that it's a small, it's a much smaller crop than they expected, because when they came to press the um, uh, grapes um, for the reds, they discovered there was so little juice inside. And normally you calculate something like 315, 320 uh, kilos of grapes in order to make a barrel of wine. And this year you needed 360 kilos to get to your barrel. So it's sort of um, that gives you an indication of how much less juice there is than normal in it. So it's possible some people have ordered up uh, more um, barrels than they were actually um, would have expected to, uh, uh, that, that in fact they needed when they came to getting their juice. But um, there's no particular oak, oak direction one way or another. Um, so, Do you have a feel, Jasper, of what the wines will do post bottling. I mean, they have a lot of matière. Mm. I, I found very little dryness on most of the wines. It's hard to imagine they'll shut down in the same way as, say, 2005, for example. Um, they might. Um, <laughs> uh, because again, with the reds, we do have variation. What's interesting is that those which are highest in alcohol. Um, they have this very rich fruit. Um, they do have some acidity, which sort of keeps them seemingly fresh. And I think they will be that much less fresh later on. And, um, but the third aspect is a lot of them have, I'm trying to, I haven't yet found the word in English to describe the tannins, but you go from underripe, you get hard tannins, ripe, you get fine grained tannins, overripe, the tannins suddenly become rough and ugly and sort of crumbly is a word that's occurred to me, but I don't know if that idea will get across. Um, so, um, uh, and, that, and that I'm seeing. Um, so, whereas the white seemed to me to be intrinsically balanced pretty well everywhere, pretty much everywhere, 
the reds it's not the case um so the upside that i was sort of talking about when i was um, talking about how much i enjoyed some of the reds um is a very high upside but really 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 and i'm going to try and bring these out in my tasting notes so those of you who are subscribers to um jmib just morris inside burgundy uh, or those of you who are about to become subscribers you will get uh, take, i haven't worked out how many wines will be in the end but two and a half thousand three thousand wines from this 2020 vintage i'm going to try this year and extend my um uh view so that there will be more negatives as well as all the positives and i'm going to have many more of my five star top end wines i think in 2020 but i'm also going to have more of the sort of two star this this isn't hasn't made it um wines um because there are plenty even from good people where i have a question mark about the balance of the wine um so even so, I mean, the, it's pretty massive. The tannins are certainly going to be there because they're ripe. You don't taste them too much. It's not impossible that this vintage will close down more than 19s, for example, and more than 15s. So, uh, Tom, I'll probably, I won't get the, the coat to bone should <laughs> come out before the end of the year, probably between, possibly before Christmas Eve, if not between Christmas and the New Year. And the coat and notes will come out very shortly after that. And Stephen, not much more. Sure, um, the, the amphorae um, um, in clay, uh, sometimes terra cotta, um, and sometimes in what they call grey earthenware. Uh, yeah, I mean, more and more people have got one or two to play with, but there's not much significant movement in terms of somebody just using that. Um, right. So. Uh, what else would you like me to uh, comment on, Jason, on, on the reds? I think we, we mentioned about the whites, the comparison with 18, 19, and 20. It's the same, the same comparison on, on the reds. Um, of those vintages, did you find the 18s in reds showed the most heat? Um, here in the reds, it is amazing how different it is. Some people said, that, oh, the 18s are horrible, but the balance is fine in 19s. I mean, 20s are all right. Others, 18 were high in alcohol, 19 was higher, and 20 was higher still. One producer who I think you don't work with in uh, Flaget Echezo, who when I tasted last year and tasted some 15.5s and commented on it, uh, he said, oh, we'll come back next year and it'll be 16.2. So that's why I haven't booked to go back, but I, I probably ought to. He's quite famous. Um, anyway. Um, it, it is an uneven picture insofar as that different people um, seem to it seem to work differently for them across the three vintages. Probably most often 19 was the highest in alcohol. Probably most often 18 was the one which was most affected by the hot dry conditions because you had more bacterial spoilage in 18 and you had more volatile volatility in the wines. Having said which, the people who didn't have bacterial spoilage and didn't have volatility, and of course that's the majority, uh, I really loved their 18s. I thought they were magical wines and I didn't find too much of um, sort of hot vintage flavor in the fruit profile. 19, there was very much less spoilage going on and the fermentations went through very much more easily for most people. Um, uh, but I did find you know, the flavor of not cooked, but certainly quite warm fruit. In 2020, there, I, I want to reinforce this idea, but there is something of everything. And it is going to be um, a question of reading the notes quite carefully in 20 and checking to see if it's your style of wine. And there are some people who've actually made some wines which are still quite elegant, very much in red fruit, not too dark in colour, and are, are classical wines. Others have made some brilliant wines uh, in a deeper, richer, more powerful style, but still balanced. And a third group have also made very good wines, but for me, they're a little bit too rich and the fruit is a little bit too too much showing the, showing the sunshine. Um, and then there are more other people again, where the wines are clearly unbalanced and not good news. Do you feel if someone was, is farming organically or biodynamically, that, that has a, had a positive effect in 2020 or, or a negative one? Uh, I mean, okay, so I'm a fan of biodynamics and, um, and I've you know, been in favour of the concept of it. 2020 is the first time I've seen a vintage in which it seems to have been 
uh, a clear bonus insofar that several of the people who had the best yields of you know, famous growers who are not trying to have high yields, but where they had the least loss, uh, and I'll cite two who sadly I think um, may, not, may not be yours, but um, um, Lafarge in Volnay and Rossignol Trappe in chevrolet Chambertin, they both had yields in sort of 40 hectares a hectare and an effortless sense of balance throughout and, and um, alcohol levels of sort of 13.2, 13.5, you know, perfectly where you want them. Um, I haven't finished, I've done most of my coat to bone tastings, but uh, um, I've still got a lot more to do in, um, in the Cote de haven't done anybody yet in Murray Saint Denis or Chambord Musny. Um, done some in most of the other villages, um, but um, uh, those would be two examples of, of of biodynamic producers where it's really worked. But by and large, the the sort of narrative that's in most people's minds that if you're organic biodynamic, you're bound to make less of a crop doesn't seem to be the case in 2020 at all. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, which regions, sub-regions have done well in the reds. Um, I think if we, if we start right up in Chablis land, uh, in the red wine satellite villages, I think those over towards Tonnerre, like Epinoy, um, and, uh, and also probably fine um, towards Auxerre in the Côte d'Auxerre, they're fine. Um, the grapes ripen perfectly. Uh, there's still plenty of juice in them. They're great. Irancy, I don't know if you work with anybody in Irancy, uh, Jason, but there, I, it, it's, it's an area where you're on these steep, um, arid slopes, and they had tiny yields, and I slightly worry about the future of that appellation uh, if we're going to get more hot, dry years. Uh, moving south, um, I haven't done wide tasting in uh, the Cote Chalonais, so I'm not going to comment there. Um, Cote de Bone, it was a little bit more of a struggle, for sure. Um, but um, I got less of a feeling in, you may remember, um, for 2018s, I was worried about Volnay, and I definitely found some vineyards which had dried out uh, before um, the grapes had got um, right. I mean, so the flavours got too ripe, but the structure hadn't got ripe enough. So you've got overripe grapes with underripe tannins. And that would be really ugly and very dry in parts of Volnay in 2018. It's less the case in 2020. And I think that is, um, uh, referring again to a comment somebody asked earlier, I think there is an issue, um, a positive feeling with the Pinot Noir is that the vines are beginning to learn the new rules. And I found that the excess of heat or drought um, affected a little bit less in 2020 than it probably had in 2018. Um, Pomar again has, has played a blinder. Um, I've still got a few more visits to do there, um, but those are typically more humid soils, so, so they don't mind um, drought conditions as much. Uh, Pomar is really, really good. Um, again, I've still got to do a bit more tasting in the in the sort of the side valley, um, uh, Vignales, uh, Saramar, Osedures, and so on. Um, but in general, they, those cooler places, the oak coats have done very well. They were getting 12 and out, they were getting 13 natural, which probably never really happened. Um, and uh, what else have I done? Um, nothing else in uh, the bone strikes me as problematic. Had some good results around the, the hill of Corton, uh, very good results in Savigny les Bones. Um, moving to Cote de Nuit, uh, I haven't yet finished tasting in Nuit, and some of the producers I've tasted in Nuit have been fine, but I've seen in the Gossions, when you taste a whole range up and down the coat, if there's one village that's got a bit out of control and, and definitely a little bit overripe, it has been Nuit Saint-Georges. But this is often the case. The growers who are based there are more on top of it, um, and, uh, and I think that is, is less often the case. Um, I can't really speak much about Chambol and Moray. Uh, had some good results in Chevrolet. Once you get up as far as Marcenay um, uh, in particular, uh, it got pretty dry and they have, they have some soils which are very dry uh, and a little bit more problematic, but the parts of Marcenay which are not on the alluvial river soils uh, uh, were looking very good today, I thought. Um, we have a little question from Sarah saying about um, water was key. Yes, water remains key. 
Uh, and that's a long-term thing. That's not just about uh, any one vintage. From here on, water is going to be key. And the basic um, water table, the nappe phréatique in French, in general, is fine because we've had enough water during the winter. But that operates for the lower-lying vineyards. And up at the top of the hills, there are certain appellations where you get little springs high up, a uh, bit in top of Pudigny, uh, sort of we certainly in Marange, one or two other places. And those higher up uh, vineyards are the ones which are really in danger of drying out. So we're going to have to be monitor those for the future. Um, <coughs> oh, yeah. do, do you think we're right on the limits of what Pinot Noir and Chardonnay can cope with? Uh, um, Pinot Noir, yes. Chardonnay, no, because we know we can, you can make great Chardonnay in, in many parts of California, Australia and the rest of it. The Chardonnay, as I've said before, is basically a weed that will grow anywhere, and it does change the style, but it works anywhere. You can have great Chardonnays at 11 and a half, 12 degrees, and you can have great Chardonnays at 15 degrees. Pinot, for me, uh, I'm happier at 12 and a half than I am at 13 and a half, except at the top vineyards, um, and I'm certainly happier in, in sort of below 13s than I am at 14 plus, and I definitely don't want to know about it at 15 and a half. Um, so, um, it's more at risk, you know, for sure. Um, growers are being pretty impressive in the way that they're trying to tackle this and they haven't lost morale. One or two have thrown their hands up and sort of put their aprons over their head and said, five years time, we'll all, all, be, we'll all be out of business. But that's rare. Most of them are working hard. What sort of rootstocks are we gonna plant? Uh, what sort of pinot material are we gonna put in the ground? Because um, they're having to do an awful lot of replanting because of this rootstock issue, the 161, 49 rootstock, which is giving up the ghost in any recent plantations. Um, and viticulture is changing as well, but I mean, um, it's not really the point of this evening to go into all those changes, uh, uh, the, all the big issues of climate change and viticultural changes. We haven't got time to do that tonight. It's more about the 2020 vintage. Um, so um, yeah. That would be if I, I read something this afternoon where I said, is, is, is 2020 a great vintage? Um, and I, I still don't know from red wines. But it's certainly full of great wines. Is that, is that probably the best way to sum it up? There are some yeah, I mean, I certainly went through a phase of thinking, I'm hating these 2020 reds, but that was pretty early on and much more Cote de Bain based. And I thought the, the great wines were more of an exception. And then I've started to change my mind. And I had a couple of days when I thought, bloody hell, these are great. And there are moments when you do have to take into account the extraordinary intensity of these wines, which means that you can actually pass over them and just think that they're, you know, it's a, it's, it's a hot vintage and it's too powerful. And then you realize that what you have just finished tasting doesn't feel unbalanced at all at the end. And it's just that there is such an intensity that there are only vaguely beginning to show what they're about and I really didn't feel that in 2019 and I don't you wouldn't have either I don't suppose and they were lovely lovely wines beautiful wines very very good wines um but I think there is something the 2020s which work I think I, is a whole another another level again I think it, the proportion which do work and I'm not yet ready to put a figure on that proportion I think will be legendary wines I think that's probably a very good place to end the discussion, actually. <laughs> all, the wines terms, the, all the wines of the Flint Wines portfolio. <laughs> Clearly. Well, Clearly. I think, I think pe people will obviously be um, bursting with anticipation to read your tasting notes, Jasper. Can you, can you just tell them again how they can do that and subscribe to your site? Yeah, it's great. I mean, if you Google Inside Burgundy, you might get a reference to, to my book, um, or you might get a reference to the site, but it is um, www.insideburgundy or one word dot com Great and we, we recommend everyone subscribes. Um, thank you so much Jasper, it's fascinating to hear your take on this probably unique vintage is, is probably the best way to describe it um, both in for reds and whites um, what a lot of pleasure we're going to get drinking them over the next 30-40 years I guess yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, thank, thank God we're all so young. 
Oh, thank God. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, I'd just like to say thank you. And um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm also fascinated by all the people who have all sorts of uh, uh, names from past and present in my, uh, in my life. So I'm really, really um, good to see you all here uh, tonight. And thank you for following through. And um, we will stay in touch and continue to enjoy good Burgundy for as long as we possibly can. Great. Thank you, Jasper.